welcome to Inception Dialogues. This is only our second episode, and the first episode with a guest. Yet, it is a fantastic episode, as I think you will agree uh, at the end of it. I spent quite some time last night talking to my friend, psychologist uh, Rick Stewart, about the human condition, the meaning of life, love, and also suffering, pain, and death. Yet it has been a very, very positive conversation. A conversation in which, at the end, uh, Rick uh, opened his heart, opened himself up, and offered me and you um, many jewels that I think will be of, of great value, especially if you, like most of the rest of us, uh, suffer. So sit back, relax, and join me in my conversation with uh, Rick Stewart. Have fun. Rick, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate your time. Um, we have done these conversations many times before. This one will be the first that uh, we are going to share with the world. Um, we've had a lot of fun before. I'm sure we are going to have a lot of fun today. And I even suspect that we are going to uh, explore new territory. <laughs> Something will unfold. <laughs> Given the miraculous way we came together we still don't know um, in the many hours of wandering through life in some form or fashion some magic seems to arise maybe we can start by uh, by my letting you just uh, tell a little bit uh, about yourself to the rest of us uh, uh, who you are uh, your background um, how did we end up here? <laughs> the last part, I'm not sure. <laughs> and I, I, th which biography do I give? I probably had four or five different biographies before they t became. I'll speak from where I'm at now and present my past in a way articulated now in hindsight of where I am. I was an only child for seven and a half years before my mother downloaded three and three daughters <laughs> kind of fell apart. And it was my duty to take care of everybody. That's how we get into the helping professions. That's why you become a healer, right? From very uh, early. And that's what our downfall is too, of course. <laughs> that's how it works. But yes, I had a contract to take care of before I even knew it. An early memory uh, is I, my mother, who had never worked and left home at 15, it took me years to put that together. Very poor family, very fragile, and was a profoundly attentive to our home. She made uh, carpets in a style that's no longer made. She could have been an engineer, yet she was very injured, very hurt. But she, I was an only child for a long time. And I got some things from that that I see now as, as a blessing. I didn't see then. One of them is that she read. Or when we had no bookshelves or books in the house, but my mother would go to the library and get them. She always felt inferior for not having a high school education. I went to the Salvation Army store with my mother. That's where uh, Goodwill, uh, I don't know if an equivalent in where people give their stuff away sure, and yeah. people buy thrift. My mother would buy wool for her braided drugs and I would see a book every now and then for a nickel. And I must have been seven. And I have no idea why. I picked up the book and I said to my mother, this is a nickel, would you buy it for me please? She said, sure. 
And it was Freud's interpretations of dreams. Oh my god. I didn't know that. <laughs> hey, I'm holding stuff back. You, you want this you want me. You got me. <laughs> oh, this is a wonderful story. <laughs> Through a nickel. I picked that book. Did I understand it? No. How could I? But I was fascinated by it. Dreams, inner life, feeling, dreams, magic. Because essentially I was in my field in America. We finally have named, uh, we found our soul that our William James began with. <laughs> And that's the inner subjective life. Uh, I was a feeler. I saw and felt from birth. And I pretty quickly learned to stop telling my family or my mother that rock in the backyard, that glows. Or the there are people in my room. <laughs> no, they're shadows. I'm not going to argue, Mom. I had to, I was born with a predisposition of, of feeler which um, could have crushed me and almost did but I got became a good enough dancer and <laughs> faked my way through I shut down that part of me I thought and I didn't show it how old were you when you realized that you had that that other people didn't have it and that you needed to to hide it I would say 50 <laughs> <laughs> To want the truth, okay. <laughs> to articulate that, I, I had to be 50. <laughs> I couldn't say that. I had no, I did know, there was an unspoken sort of knowing that, don't say this, it's not good to say too much. So I simply, seamlessly, I think, shut it down to a greater or le lesser extent. I began to apply to psychology programs in the 70s. I had a master's degree while I was in the service. Instead of going to the NCO club and drinking with my British and French and Dutch blokes, I actually got a master's degree from the University of Southern California without ever attending the, on campus. So I must have had something. You did, yeah. I must have. But I, I don't know. There's much mystery in this. And that's the fun of it. Um, the GI Bill paid for your doctorate, basically. and I was very fortunate. It paid for that. Plus, I was given graduate assistantships. Which, if I taught a class as a graduate, would pay part of the tuition. So between the two, I was able to get a doctorate and leave... Uh, and finish without any bills. Okay. So how long have you been practicing now, uh, Rick, uh, as a psychologist, as a therapist? That's an in I'll go back to grad school and work from there. I came back to Penn State University, which is one of the finer, uh, had one of the finer psychology departments in the nation, in the top ten. American psychology was in the thrall of Skinner's black box. I call it Buddhism without the mind. Can you give us a little background on Skinner and, and what he was saying? What was the philosophy behind that? Skinner and Watson, Pavlov in Russia, they were looking at the conditioned patterns of behavior and how the reward and punishment system, reward or, I don't think we use punishment, but basically it was, <laughs> negative reinforcement. And there were different patterns. One would not look to the mind. One would look for inter-rater reliability by operationalizing the behavior that could be observed in the empirical model of observer, subject, inner rate of reliability. In other words, 
psychology was trying to become physics. Mm, deterministic yeah. and mechanistic. And that was not where I was coming from. I was a fish out of water. Somehow, I had stumbled on... I, William James was my hero, and he's the one that spoke. The father of American psychology, ironically, was not even mentioned in graduate school. Hmm. I was a fish out of water. Okay, I didn't tell a lot of people that. I tap danced. No one was interested. In that was during your doctorate, right, in the 60s? Yeah, the 70s. We're talking from oh, 76 yeah. to 79. I finished my dissertation. I was an ABD. Uh, I went to work in my field uh, of psychology before I finished my doctorate. And then I had to work two years to be licensed to practice professionally on my own. I happened to have the good grace, and I didn't see it at the time, in tiny central Pennsylvania, there were very few practitioners, and I was able, by the time I got my doctorate, before I got my doctorate, I did crisis intervention. That was the first job I had. I went to the places where the state police that were six foot seven said, you go in and tell them not to kill themselves. I thought, they got guns and clubs, and they're telling me that's about 140 pounds. Okay. That was, I wasn't. So when you asked when I began practicing psychology, that was it. Before, before I got my doctorate, I began to experience. Um, and I was able to experience working in a number of settings that I would not, a young psychologist now, in this area would not have access to community mental health I worked in school districts I worked in I taught for several years in academia I liked teaching I was a, I was a non-tenure track uh, professor and I wouldn't have done well in the vertical world of, mm -hmm. I saw that I was by nature a clinician and I had the opportunity of being involved in 1984, I had been kind of working in a number of places. I was about to get my license. I had enough hours. And we opened a psychiatric, freestanding psychiatric hospital in central Pennsylvania. And I got hired. I did something I didn't know uh, anyone else was doing. I don't think I knew I was doing it. I was not doing what my field tends, tended to do was to see a person and put them into a diagnosis that labeled them. The very act of doing that contracted what might be possible to see. Mm -hmm. It boxes them in, right? It boxes them in and leaves off the reality tunnel what else is happening? Yeah. I, there were several others doing it earlier than I was, as I discovered um, through the work of Wilson Van Dusen, who was in the 60s encountering hallucinations. What I found out, if I were labeling it today, I wouldn't have labeled it at the time, as I sat without I tried to, without uh, prejudice, without labeling, and engage the phenomena and experience at face value, watching it, curious. Tell me, that hallucination? No. Put him on more hell doll. Got to get rid of, what's that hallucination? Will it talk to me? Hmm. What will it say? I don't want to restrain them and shoot Thorazine into... That's brutalizing. There are schizophrenics who are, could have been saints, but took that path and were brutalized I, in our culture. I know that. There's a fine line. We all walk. 
So you have been uh, practicing psychology for over 30 years. You have been, as you described earlier, you, you have been basically an, an anthropologist of the human mind, somebody who looks at people without preconceptions, without labels, without strong theoretical uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, uh, you just look at what's happening, you observe with an open mind. Uh, and you've been doing that for a long time. What have you learned, Rick, in, in all this time about the human condition, the human, the human soul and, and where we are today? What I have learned is said in Shakespeare, Hamlet says, I believe to Horatio about there is more mystery than your philosophies tell you I have been by being an, as much as possible a neutral witness and that's only there is distortion I can't but I tried to just witness I began to discover there were things occurring in human beings that were not being seen that consciousness played out within a human being, one human being. We're so conditioned into seeing a, a, us as separate. So whether ontologically different in, entities were involved with hallucinations, they were of the pathologized or not, was not the point. What are they telling us about? What's the story about? And it's far vaster and then the reality tunnel integrates it. My reality tunnel over the years as I moved into private practice over the last 20, I probably had about 45,000 hours clinically observing with neutral suspension uh, now it's a bit different because there's a presence that's co-created in my room. It's not what I was, I've lived into, and that's driven with love. But I learned to see what others weren't seeing because the technicians and the labelers, and I say that without it, that's what it was. There are people of heart in all fields, and then there are technicians. There are teachers, doctors, janitors of heart, and then there are those who don't have it. So I found myself probably practicing heart-based uh, observation, if any prejudice it was on the side of heart-based, before um, America rediscovered Buddhism and happiness and <laughs> mindfulness. I was doing it and I'm saying that with it's impersonal. I was just stumbled into it by neutrally as we do in meditation watching. Would you and say that uh, would you say that the heart uh, was a kind of extra sense that allowed you to see things that were real, things that were true about the, about human beings and the human mind, that without the heart, metaphorically speaking, it couldn't be seen, couldn't be even studied because they wouldn't be perceived. Without the heart. And the, the idea of the dualism of uh, going to the heart without the rational mind is we don't lose our rational mind, we maintain that. But it drops into the apprehension of the heart. It's driven. So the rational and the heart was clear to me. I lived into that. And meanwhile, my just about career, I, I, I'm, I'll be 64 soon, my field in America has found William James again and Buddhism, American style, and not Richard Alpert and Ron Dawson, <laughs> but psychology has secularized. Skinner's black box mind is now involved again. What I've learned is we're finding that without 
some sense of inner subjectivity, which we can empirically study, and the Dalai Lama agrees. He says if science in some way shows, I mean, Buddhism is a psychology that is overlaid with um, religious practice. Mm -hmm. It's a psychology of the mind, of watching. And the Dalai Lama says empirical, radical empiricism, as William James says, phenomenology, and as you have so said quite well, uh, which brought me to you uh, through reading your three books before I came to your site, um, is that we can study the inner subjective and make empirical observation states and stages of awareness can be studied and injunctions can be made and if you do this they've been doing this in the lineage of the buddhist tradition for centuries if you do this this will happen or this will not so they have a very refined empirical approach yeah. that we have not had in the west and, and, and if we and if we have, we sort of tend to to constrain it with uh, ontological assumptions that may not apply, right? Uh, right? Assumptions like, uh, well, the mind is the brain, therefore the field of possibilities here is much reduced, and and you don't explore certain options uh, that you would explore if you had a neutral, empirical, phenomenological approach to what you're observing, right? You keep the universe open, or and my experience has been working my life informs my work and as I move through life so do my clients and what I see is wider and wider space around them I perceive how things that were outliers uh, we're always there, those synchronicities or coincidences, often funny, that I didn't see. And I see miracles on my couch that I didn't, I had to live into seeing, that were always there. The openness I, I, and the heart stumbled upon a wider range of what we are and what we potentially could be and don't know it and I go back to it led me to stumble through life uh, building a an art form of my own silently I never spoke with anyone but I couldn't if I had no cohorts to speak with and if I did it would be sound like new age bad stuff <laughs> so I shut my mouth and then I encountered it in books that other people and, but what I found out was um, no therapist can take a client farther than, than they themselves have been. And They themselves, the therapists. The therapists. So my hell realms, we all experience here at terrible times, those contracted states. I see on my couch, I may move to... A place of my own hell realm and sit in presence uh, that's all wordlessly sit in presence resonating with the person at the fetal position on my couch there's nothing else to say there's nothing to but it also allows me to move back and forth and discover an ontological boundary that many have crossed in crossing that boundary there's, there are no words the English language is a language of nouns yeah. it's good for putting things into concepts process language for being and this is being picked up in my field there are transpersonal psychologists Jungians who are writing about the second half of life the movement into being, seeing things from a different perspective, meaning. What is the meaning of this? I get up, I became somebody, brushed my teeth, and 
like Collies and Hillman who, who, who wrote about it, right? Hillman uh, is a brilliant writer. Uh, and there are several others, a Franciscan priest uh, who's also a transpersonal Jungian psychologist. And he speaks of falling upward, and I'm blanking on his name, but he says that, and there are a number of books coming out now about that ontological boundary. Why do you call it an ontological boundary? You're, you're cl clearly taking this out of the realm of psychology and into the realm of reality at large. You're I, right. Is that your experience with, with this? Yes. It is an ontological change in being. In the waking up, or the story of the experiencing directly the sense of the the eternal face and I had this since childhood it's the same face that comes up if I'm still it, we are the space our eternal face in which the story is dreamt and there are no rules the connections are directly experienced of the Christ in you and the Christ in me and the namaste that truth is we're swimming in it there's no secret order of yeah. why wisdom keepers who know it's exactly the it's opposite right under our noses <laughs> we're swimming in it yeah it's everywhere that's why it's so difficult to see and it's also must be lived into and um some of the nuggets that used to be jingle bells for me reread was like there it is Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is here, right here, right now. And this is where I get somewhat uh, theoretical. And I'm not an academician, but I've read a lot because it's a passion. And I've experienced, what I've experienced is informed by the, informs the passion for which uh, I know that it's a dismantling it happens, there is no journey, and we're all connected, and it's a palpable experience. And it isn't always there. But I've had, once I moved into not Rick, then my people on the couch began to tell me more and more and more because they were seeing them. So there has been a, an amplification, and that is an ontological different way of being. You often talk about uh, the difference between doing and, and being. So when you say, not Rick, uh, in, in, in my ears, uh, what, you're, what I hear is that you're saying, Rick not trying to do, but Rick just being, uh, uh, not possessed by the daemon of the ego that tries to get us always to act and do and follow procedures. Um, how do you see this, this difference between doing and being? It, it seems to me it's a key difference and extremely relevant for people today. Yes, it is. We have to become someone in order to, to lose it <laughs> and to cross that ontological boundary between doing and being. So first, be in the marketplace and become something. Uh, Ken Wilber talks about the pre-trans fallacy that Freud said the cosmic experience of falling into the light is really a regression toward ch childhood and mother, mother-child. And the pre-trans fallacy states that we become someone, first half of life, in the second part, and this is a wordless, and, and it cannot be, it's individual, there's mystery, but there's also a sense that I am the space where Rick dreams he's Rick. So it's not as much, Rick's not, I can see Rick, I can encounter him, but he's a dreaming 
when Buddha was once asked if he was God, he said, no, I'm awake. Well, that was, in the 60s, was an unattainable goal of enlightenment. And the whole myth of enlightenment is taken on in the West. But there is a moving, and I see it, whether you have a third grade education, and you, there's a saint store among us who have moved without the language in, into a place that's no longer first half of doing. It is an ontological space, but it's only a space. As a child, I had out-of-body experiences. I remember them. It's the same space I move into when I could parallel process, see my body, a two-year-old body, and also float out somewhere else. Under hypnosis, and we've been doing this for three centuries, longer probably, but certainly in the West, under hypnosis, people can be brought back to remembering at birth. And what they remember is a parallel coming through the birth canal, but also witnessing themselves. If I understood you, the fallacy is that uh, what happens in the second li half of life is not a regression to an earlier stage, but a, a sort of spiral progression to something larger, something yeah. bigger, to a state of being instead of a state of doing. The movement into the face we had before we were born, which is a spaceless, undefinable place where heart the rule is driven by an influx of some mystery and source. It's constantly an influx. And we're part of it and it. So we get in all to the paradox. But that's available not just to monks and Buddhism and up in the mountains and caves. I want to ask you about suffering. Um, you have been dealing with people at their most vulnerable, at the, their most open state for, for decades now. And um, I think we, we've talked about it before and I think we agree that uh, there is a generalized increase in, in, in suffering uh, amongst people of all classes, of, of all ethnicities, of all backgrounds. Um, it's like a, an epidemic. Um, and I wonder in all these years, what you have learned about uh, the nature of this suffering. Uh, what is happening to humankind? What, what is happening to us? Why are we all suffering so much, even though we do our best not to show it, and, some, and often we succeed in not showing it. Uh, but in the privacy, in the sanctity of our own minds, uh, we are all suffering. What's going on? Well, I, th I think there's been a pervasive loss of the language of attachment and of attunement. Suffering is a lack of meaning in, in the culture. People who are fundamentalists of any faith or political believers, they still suffer from lack of meaning, enchantment, passion, a sense of being part of this very ground, this which we came from, the miracle of awe, we have the most material comfort than any other historical period of time that yeah. I know of. Yet we live, and I'm speaking in America, so I can't speak for Western culture as a whole. We are atomized. We do not have the bonds of clan, family, the storyteller who comes to tell the myth of how we began and who we are. We didn't have the shamans who go to the other world where in the magical uh, mode in the Amazon or in Siberia you still have shamans who go to the other world, are cru crucified or dismembered and come back and give love and healing by going over there. So 
the suffering is both ways. I see the suffering as the fundamental core sense of meaningless and disconnection, unconsciously at first, I think. And um, bringing that into awareness and then creating a language, putting into form in the theater of the mind a template. Once we got that, we can begin to make choices uh, instead of being conditioned. We are also deeply conditioned, some all of our lives. I know there are others who write about free will and the likes. I have encountered how deeply conditioned I am, all of us are. But unless we name it and put it into form, we can't create freedom. Yeah. Potential for novelty. So we are back to that question of the interface between psychology and ontology, right? Because you just diagnose um, our current human suffering as a lack of meaning, as a lack of connection to the earth, to each other, and to something that is transcendent. Um, but how does the therapist in the therapy room uh, restore that to the patient or to your fellow pilgrims, as you call them? How do you restore that if, if they believe in the ontology of materialism, if they believe that fundamentally we are biological machines, fundamentally disconnected from everybody and everything else, how can therapy be done without an interface to a conducive ontology? Is this absolutely necessary, do you think? Yes, absolutely. And how it's done is step by step we give language and form to what was once unconscious and unfelt and begin to develop a language that shows and, and a vocabulary that speaks of human beings as processes. Whitehead said it. As moving down the river, we're never the same. Our bodies are, we're always moving and we must. And what the cause of much suffering is, is that people want, are, the culture that loses the language of movement and sacred roots and processes, people are encouraged to become nouns. And when one becomes a noun, we grasp and we suffer. A noun as opposed to a verb, to a process. And, and even the word, our human being is a being, is a verb. We're a process. Uh, there, there's a giving up of truth that your spirit somehow wants to move and you suffer that way. Sometimes I'll, an actor in me <laughs> arises and I say, just think of the miracle. Just don't think, just experience you and I coming from an exploding Nova oven that created the rare chemicals that hit this tiny dust moat of a planet <laughs> on one of the outer limbs of the Milky Way, one of billions of galaxies, billions of years ago, and forms a biosphere because it has a moon and the right to... Just, and we no have... Just think that. Don't think, experience it. And then I'll say, I want to fall down and just, I don't know what the mystery is, but I'm awed by it. It's alive, and I'm part of it. And we cannot grasp fully, not here, but we can experience something of that mystery, and we must put that back into language. Rick, That's is, how. It, is it our language today that is creating a barrier between us and that living mystery? Wittgenstein wrote 
in the 20th century about language, of course. And uh, yes, we our language of love, God. What was it? Einstein said, if asked if he believes in God, maybe apocryphal. But he'd say it would be, depend by what you mean. There are wide parameters for many words that are thrown into the culture, and we're not speaking from the same positions. Just to know that, most people don't even know that in our culture. Love. What is it? Happiness. What is it? Suffering. How is that different from pain? We've talked about three, a number of things, but three in particular that come, come to my mind now. We've talked about uh, the end of suffering, we've talked about uh, moving across the ontological boundary between doing and being, and at some point you, when you were talking about how to end suffering, you, you talked about surrendering, a form of surrendering to what is. Are we talking about the same thing across these three different avenues? Surrendering, moving I into being, and the end I, of suffering? I, there are two words in my practice that I am very clear of how I'm using them, how we are using them. S surrender and selfish. And surrendering to many, if it's undefined, is to throw up the white flag and give up. It's a negative way of, negative valence into that. And surrendering is not uh, in this room, in the language of meaning that we're trying to create or recreate, we discover nothing is new. We reiterate. We surrender is an act of movement toward accepting what is in the moment, right now. That is essentially the polarity, and I don't want to use polarity because polarities are actually one that is, in essence, a very different way of using surrendering. So yes, the language, I'm very careful with that, and selfish. If someone says, well, that would be selfish of me if I didn't put my children first before, and I try to clarify or read delineate selfish. Selfish in a negative way means on uh, not being generous. Uh, what's mine's mine? What's yours mine? Got to keep mine. It's behaving as we do. There are starving people. Well, cruise ships throw out food every day. <laughs> and people are eating mud pies in Haiti. Having a direct sense of that is a profound responsibility. So acting in one's self-interest is an act of love. You have a soul contract to take care of and move down that river. That self-interest that is not selfish. I want to come back to the to, well, stay in the subject of suffering, because I think a lot of people people listening to this will ask themselves, uh, okay, how how do I surrender them then? If the key to the end of suffering is surrender, even though the entire culture is telling us, never surrender, never surrender, but they mean something else, and the problem there is a problem of language. Uh, even if you go across that language boundary and you understand that the key is in surrendering, how do you surrender? There, there, there doesn't seem to be a key to that, right? There is no recipe for it. It's almost a paradoxic act of being told, be spontaneous. <laughs> one, uh, how one surrenders is a mystery. I don't know. I encountered it in my own experience. I don't know what led to it. I certainly wasn't acts of grace. 
but the surrender is a movement that feels like the other may not be maybe a part of me I'm not aware of in the membrane but the mystery is how did I get pushed off the cliff into the surrendering and there is I have no answer for the gateless gate the journey that's never begins the more one journeys there are paradoxes in all of this and I don't know but without having the language and the ideas put back into the cultural reality tunnel in some way bit by bit and it is your generation the younger generation the movement inward down or up depending on how one wants to use it same that responsibility all I can say uh, I am here I came to you because I saw that you had after reading your books you a transdisciplinary background and that's where the paradigm changers are I am not going to criticize the as a layman the philosophy of some of our eminent uh, physicist which is a branch of philosophy <laughs> but uh, even as a humble layman I will say clueless is <laughs> but it's the horizontal knowing that we you create a book based upon the, using the metaphors of now to revitalize and bring back into the culture what has been said for 40,000 years by bards and then put into written text there was no homer there were genera 20,000 years yeah and then it was written yeah you that's you. the responsibility is to deepen and bring meaning back to explicate the language a new language the tipping point is how many of you are out there that know that your task to do it's urgent it's urgent I know you feel it others young and it's happening young, young, with younger people yet the momentum of the current system or the current way of seeing the world the current worldview and paradigm is is very strong yes and it, it 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 doesn't matter sometimes how absurd it actually is how obviously absurd it is the current paradigm uh, the momentum is so strong that it makes it so easy to believe in it without questioning it, 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 uh, it the mission is very hard it, um, it is. and it's, uh, there are days I'm hopeful there are days uh, I am not but uh, but I am with you on on the need for a new language because w as you said and I am with you there we live within our language uh, language defines our reality to a large extent um, we will see how it will go. Well, it's certainly um, a bringing back to life. And my op most optimistic days, as you do, we oscillate. The universe breathes in and breathes out. We have good time. It's about asking why and getting to the root cause of why I'm depressed gets you nowhere. You're still suffering. <laughs> and it's called depression to your insurance company. It's the fact that watching media and politics, political media of half truths and lies, and how people believe without any ground the shallowness of labels. Yeah. Exactly. And that's very disturbing. Exactly. 
there will always be a minority, I, I believe, of those who are born curious or want to know more or look around corners under fences. That's okay. But we must have a tipping point. Do not give up hope. Love permits. And somehow, I see, see the miracles I had to live into seeing them. But love permits. And what unfolds is absolutely unpredictable. We were talking earlier about the, the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And I was browsing the other day the, the latest version, version 4 from the year 2000, I think. And what struck me was that uh, every psychological state that entails a little bit of discomfort or unease for self or others is classified in the DSM, the Bible of Psychiatry and Psychology today as a disorder that needs to be cured. In other words, anything, anything at all in our minds that entails suffering is, um, is considered unnatural. It's considered something that needs to be fixed. And I was wondering, doesn't that rob us from the meaning of our suffering? I mean, we already suffer. If one takes away the meaning of that suffering, then we have nothing. Then we are dead in body and soul. How do you see this? What is psychiatry and psychology doing today? And DSM-5 will be coming out in about two years. And what's very clear is D from the get-go, the DSM, uh, which probably first in the early 50s began to arise for classification, is a nomenclature. Puts into little categories suffering and pathologizes it. Yeah. And one lives, it's a fine line between a saint, a mystic, a cultural creative, and a life as an ambulatory schizophrenic. When <laughs> one is pathologized by a nomenclature that is based upon a committee, it's not a medical disease. It's an attempt, a poor attempt, in my opinion, because it's soul-stealing, of imitating medicine by having a disease model. And people in our culture reinforces a nomenclature which pathologizes the suffering that the very culture creates. And it sets up a paradox because if you identify with a meaningless, crazy culture, you, you become crazy. Yeah. If you don't, you may be pathologized. It, and the very fact that it needs to be explained as a nomenclature, something arrived at by committee based on certain signs and symptoms that attempts to Im imitate the scientific empirical uh, approach of the last one, 200 years, which, which does not, it's a, doesn't even, it's a fiction in that sense. It's a way of, and over time, one can see how pathologies, quote, at, there are five axes. Yes. And axis two, personality disorders. Is that a mental health disorder or a moral, ethical character issue? Yeah. Uh, one who suffers from lack of meaning may be put in a mental health category, but in fact, characterologically, they have no conscience. So, where do ethics and philosophy and the likes they get pathologized into a category and you can't treat an axis to personality you can't even tell a, a patient you're a borderline personality it's a death sentence because if they do have some of the characteristics of, they're going to blow up I don't blame them I don't I've never 
I don't label, and I never have, and I'm not special. <laughs> it's just the way as it's a fiction. There is a, a book called the PDM, the Personality Diagnostic. It's not manual. It's about that thick, and it describes much more fully certain baseline character pathologies or we term pathologies I would say ways of being in the world in which self and other are severely impaired a narcissist can do a lot of damage to people particularly if you marry one and you have a dyad or work for one but that is not taken by insurance companies for reimbursement uh -huh. So there is, and psychiatrists have given therapy away. Uh, they make, they've sold out to Big Pharma and the idea of uh, antidepressants and serotonin and reuptake. And, and as if anyone studies with any depth um, what the theories of, uh, are based upon that work for depression or anxiety, how we separate. Um, you can see it's on very flimsy ground, but our culture doesn't know that. We take more pills because we suffer from lack of a crazy culture, a <laughs> lack of meaning. Do you see, uh, Rick, with your experience dealing with the human soul all these years, do you see meaning purpose and usefulness in suffering? Is it all for nothing or is it doing something ultimately positive to us? It's taking us somewhere. Yes. One of the phrases I've used over the years, I don't know how long, and it was stolen from someone else, is that look to your depression, whatever you, the sadness, subjective sadness, the sense of ennui, Melee, good French words, the deadening, anhedonia, lack of feeling, enthusiasm for life. Um, what is that pointing toward? Your symptoms or your spirit is telling you something. Your suffering is pointing toward a movement or something. So that suffering is a pointer and must be honored, not patronizingly. And then I also delineate suffering from pain. Life is painful. There's an agony of the great destroyer and the great creator, love and beauty and pain, loss and permanence are all true. So pain of grieving something true is different than creating suffering by trying to avoid real pain mm. and getting into addictions or creating your own loop of problems and then suffering. So suffering, even that word must be, it shows how much work we have to do and by whom. And I'm practicing very isolated in a very small part of central Pennsylvania. I no longer have a public face in my community of psychologists. Now they have so many different types of practitioners. I don't work for anyone. I am here with my colleagues. I rely upon to make sure I'm following following the rules. Dalai Lama says you must follow them for 30 years before you break them for a higher good. <laughs> and one must have the hubris. Um, I would never supervise anyone <laughs> to do some something I might consider for the higher good. But when I have, I, it's worked. It's been, because it's the right thing. My patient told me that. I was, we've talked about it before, and one of the previous times we talked about it, I was meditating on this for, for a little while, particularly on the distinction between pain and suffering. And it, um, 
it occurred to me that uh, when pain is extreme and when ecstasy is extreme, they become so far apart in a kind of warped space that they touch each other and they become the same, but not suffering. Suffering no. does not do that. No, pain and ecstasy can transmute, they can become one another. Actually, they, in a way, they are the same thing when they are, in, when they are extreme but not suffering. Suffering is different. There is a... Sh I, I don't want to use the word shallowness. It's not shallow because it, it, it really ch it changes your life, but, but there is a quality to it. The yeah. quality is that it's an attempt to avoid real pain or it's suffering out of ignorance of meaning and creating loops Suffering is in loops. There's no movement. There's nothing to be learned. Repetition compulsion, the term Freud used so well, it's the strange loops of nothing to learn. Pain moves us because truth, the agony and the ecstasy is the name of the film of Michelangelo, the famous painting of Teresa of Avila, arising from her bed with an angel or a spear putting in her heart, agonizing in ecstasy. You say it as one who might have experienced some of that. Yeah. Taste the pudding. We all must taste the pudding ourselves. We are responsible and no one's going to give us a recipe that's scary and it's also a jewel it's liberating once you get past the scary <laughs> one last piece that may be of interest um, because of the way I've practiced and I have people who have never told their experiences paranormal um, particularly paranormal, they will tell them to me because I've, I know about that field, I've, I've encountered it and I listen and without judgment. In fact, I may even give language. I go, yeah, how? How'd you know that? There's a book. They're folk saints or mystics. <laughs> they don't have but one man I see uh, who is suffering I can't get him out of a loop, I, but it's not my job. I can't do that for anybody. But he is very, very, his radio receiver antenna is, his radio band, his filter is very wide. So he has phenomena occur. He has a leakage in which he says, I know I'm living three lives right now one's in Roman times and I even had a dream in one of my other lives closer to here where I'm married and have other responsibilities somewhere and I'm dreaming this life of me I'm dreaming of me in this life I thought I would have never heard that had I not been lived into 30 years of somehow listening and that was never told he had 30 years of mental health and he never told because he didn't want to be put in the hospital or given Thorazine or Haldol and besides if you look it's like looking at a surgeon and telling them that people have post-operative depression after surgery because their bodies are intruded upon. And they look over your shoulder like you're from Mars. When I say the word paranormal or this is not a, a, a typical hallucination, whatever a typical one is, I can pretty well parse out the two. There, there's a range. But... I'll get a blank look. It's not even on the radar. I can't speak for anyone else. I'm tiny and isolated. And yet, 
I can't generalize. I hope, I pray that there are others with us in this effort is essential. We must reinsole, find okay. our language, and you're very much um, part of that. You've had experience um, working with the dying. Um, I wonder what, what you've learned from that. I have been um, graced Beginning in 1993, when I began to work with, I made up a life review. Uh, I was consulting at a rehabilitation hospital, and they had a unit that had uh, obstructive pulmonary people, people who were oxygen dependent. They had worked in the brickyards, the salt mi of the mines. They were dying, and they knew it, and they were lonely. And I didn't like doing mental status exams. And this, I would have been, let's see, ni around 94. I started to hear something. I was in my 40s. And then I heard it consistently and lived into it. I would walk into the room, saw the man lonely and frightened, and began to talk, speak with them, not identifying myself with any profession, just listening. And they were men who were born in the 20, 1920s or the 1919s, came of age in the 30s, and many of them had fought in the war, and uh, were now dying alone. And I began to quietly ask about their men from central Pennsylvania, coal mines, and just the region, the local region. Many of them, third grade, seventh grade educations, drank too much. A lot of trauma they experienced during the war was never even talked about. But I began engaging them in one hour, five or six sessions. I was, didn't call it a life review. And I would begin it by introducing myself and asking what it was like in the town of Dubois during the Depression. What was it like? Tell me about it. And we would begin decade by decade. I would speak for an hour. I said, i got to go. I'll be back. And what I saw in those men was every time I came back, they had a light in their eyes. They were happy to see me. They were being listened to and telling a story of, of their lives they had never told before or have been asked or ever placed in words. They were now. And we moved through the war, and many of them were in the war. I'm talking 15 to 20 men. And they would suddenly, they would be talking about sitting in the... Uh, mountains of the Ardennes when the Germans came over when they shouldn't have and he was being in the slit trench seeing tanks and infantry coming and looking to his right and his best friend from the town next door to him in Pennsylvania who had gone through the military with him he, he saw his head blown off and in telling me that they would break down an extraordinary pain and tears and as if it were, happened moments ago so I I learned many things one of them in that is that trauma ungrieved or unspoken or pushed aside when it comes out it can be 20 30 years later it's as fresh it's frozen time they always thanked me and would say 15 or 20, I didn't write down numbers, or, but it was around that, all men uh, who knew they were dying. And they would thank me for saying, they'd say, you know, I've never talked about that. I drank a lot when I came home. May have but not been so nice to my wife, but I never talked about that. Thank you. 
And I would say that the gift is mine. It was. And we would get through to the present. And I would say this is our last time we'll be meeting. We're here in the 90s. And we look at your life. And there are themes running through it. And you, you were somebody. They saw themselves by telling their story. And there was one question I would ask at the end of the life review, and I would get a variation of the same answer that was a seed that I've heard ever since and lived into my own experience. I haven't died, but it happens to those in the clarity of seeing life at the end. They realize something that is not we're caught up in the trance and don't realize. It's not about their responses. A hundred percent. I can't say there was any, they said it in different words, but it was about, I should have worked less I and spent more time giving and loving and being with my family. It was always about a way of, I, of giving love. And it was nothing else. The house, the car, the power, the politics, the pride of whatever, a humiliation for being my wife because I had trauma and we all suffered. And in telling the story, I would help frame it in a way that showed meaning. They had meaning, but it was never explicated. That was a palpable. They gave me a grace. And from there on, I found at the in hospice or around the point of the veil of Thanatos, uh, there are sacred things. It must be a sacrament or in some form. And, and things can happen in families. Stay alert. Be present. Every family doesn't. Some of uh, don't die, mom, don't die. Others live into and the love as a presence in the room. And things happen that shouldn't happen in our Newtonian rational reality. <laughs> I, I said it. I don't do it. I experienced it empirically. <laughs> I had a patient uh, who was dying in the local hospital. I can't remember why she wasn't in a hospice, but she was there in a coma, and I had gone to see her. I had promised, and her family had arrived from out of town. And there were, I walked into the hospital room, and um, there was family. They wouldn't know who I was. And it was they were chattering away. The television was on in the middle of the day with a game show, loud. And the lights were, like, blaring. And I slipped around the corner. They were busy seeing each other again. And I quietly sat by her. I don't know how, whether she was in a vegetative coma. It didn't matter. I put my hand on her. I said nothing. And behind me, I began to hear presence. The television. I, I, I wasn't looking. I was just with her. Wordless. The television was turned off at some point. I was only there for 10 minutes. The lights came down and it became hushed in the presence and stillness. It's made sacred that death. I didn't do it. But that's how we should die. And that's a powerful, there's no more powerful work than working at the veil. Because Thanatos and Eros, agony and ecstasy are one. It's 
it's a shame that our culture takes death out of our lives. Anyone who goes to the hospital, even his grandma, she's not supposed to die. I've got a lawsuit. And we don't, you know, only two generations ago, there would be children, siblings dying in your home, grandparents, and everyone was dying. The great epidemic, pandemic of 1917, America repressed that. Um, it was a it was an international pandemic of a type of flu, killed millions, and World War One spread it. So very young, healthy people were dying. I never knew about it until 1990s. The culture, our culture, repressed that. We are not in touch with a palpable presence and beauty of what the Dalai Lama calls the crystalline, impermanent beauty with a melancholy heart. Or Eros and Thanatos. I have a man who's a teacher uh, of history, writer of a book. He's a very passionate man. And he looked at me last, two days ago. He said to me, no, you put a lot of risk out there. You are pretty transparent, and he, he has, he's a very passionate man. And I said, you, sir, are a passionate man. You recognize, you tell me the very thing who you are. I share that. I can't do it otherwise. I must do it with a passion. And he saw me. He taught, and we were laughing at that. And he said, I always thought some of the, uh, I don't let people know about much about my life, uh, was there more for the therapist than for the patient. No, I didn't. I'm more transparent now. I, might, I may fool myself by saying transparency, it's not my therapy. <laughs> I'm sharing this as part of showing the human condition is shared, and it's for you. And that discrimination is, I walk a fine line, but I'll, if I make a mistake, it'll be on the side of love or transparency. And that puts me out there, but I can't do it any other way. Passion. A culture without passion is dead without meaning, enchantment. And if anyone misuses our openness and our uh, vulnerability, then it is their problem, right? It's not ours. I had to live into that. I couldn't have been somebody I wasn't until I wasn't somebody I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I... And the term vocatus is the term I've been graced with. The, the fact that what I do from the deepest part of my nature of giving love is I'm getting paid to do something. <laughs> uh, I'm graced and I didn't earn it. I don't know how that happened. And it's a mystery and it's funny. And we're all in on the joke. And the more inclusive we are, the more love we get. And I don't know how that happened, but I'm blessed. And uh, I was taught by just, by others, what I was living into in my experiences. I wasn't teaching them. <laughs> it's very humbling. Or it was it was uh, before for <laughs> maybe it wasn't so humbling at one time i don't know i just know i can't pra practice through the dsm for pigeonhole because the story of rick is also rick the psychologist and he lived the life i can access it but that's not where my passion is it's subjective awareness, and it's impersonal. But it's 
everything. It's passion and person. Do I look worked up with passion? <laughs> this has been a jewel, my friend. <laughs> what you I... just did for the past 15 minutes. <laughs> really? Yeah. You will, you will notice it once you see it from outside. <laughs> I can't, I, I can't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, how do you see the future, the next generations, uh, given the dilemma we are in today and the crisis that, uh, that are facing us? Are you hopeful? Yes and no. Uh, it oscillates. And um, one thing I had learned over the years in practice particularly when I was doing group therapy, thousands of hours of that, nothing would be happening. And I would say to myself, trust the process. Trust the process. Even when it looked dim, it couldn't happen. And what I found is trusting the process and standing the ground and what would unfold, I wouldn't, is never what we think it is anyway, but the process, given an unfolding time, patience, always created something novel and beautiful and meaningful. And I, I take that individual experience, and here in the middle of nowhere, uh, as an anonymous man, and say, trust the process. I'd like to thank Rick once more for his openness, his courage, his willingness to share so much of himself with us. And I hope you've enjoyed and I hope it, it has been of value to you. I will see you again next time. Cheers.